Welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Keith Lewis, our speaker for today. Um, he'll be pr presenting uh, his paper, A Unified Model of Derivative Securities. So Keith started his professional career as an assistant professor at Brown University, where he pioneered the use of computers as a classroom tool in mathematics. He went on to a very successful Wall Street career at Bankers Trust, Morgan Stanley, and Bank of America Securities, where his team built the equity derivative libraries used by the trading desks to run their business. Since 2002, Keith has been a consultant for hedge funds, building valuation models and tools for exploring, testing, and implementing trading strategies, including law firms certifying tax conformance of trades and municipal bond advance refunding. He spun off a number of open source projects based on his experience with building tools his clients found useful, and he's been using them in courses he's taught at NYU, Rutgers, Cornell, and Columbia. So with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Keith. Um, please take it away. Great, thanks, thanks, Peter. I uh, appreciate you giving me the opportunity to share what I've been been thinking about over the years. I, I know I pestered you many, many times about this already. So if I see you dozing, that's fine. So you, <laughs> you, you already know it all. Um, well, I, I just want to start out by you know admitting this seems rather ambitious, uh, you know, pricing any portfolio containing any uh, instruments. But, uh, you know, I, I'm actually not solving the, the crucial problem, uh, which is uh, how to tune the model to market data. That's a very hard problem. And, you know, that's more than just a one hour lecture. Uh, and I don't have all of the solutions to that. Uh, what I'm going to present is uh, basically the mathematical knobs that you can use to solve that problem. So let's <clears throat> let's start out with what quants do. Uh, set like a, if an anthropologist observed quants in their native habitat, what would they see? Uh, they'd be writing models. Uh, for prices and, and cash flows of instruments. Uh, they try to fit the model parameters uh, to uh, existing market data. It's called tuning the model. Uh, they would compute uh, expected value and uh, derivatives of expected values to get uh, valuation and, and hedging and use that for uh, cooking up trading strategies, for example. Uh, and also use that to provide uh, a measure of how good a hedge is. And, you know, that's, you know, that's our job, right? Right? This is what we do. Mm. This is what quants don't do, or maybe what quants should do and, and don't do a good job of, uh, in my opinion. Uh, we, we don't really provide realistic models, you know, starting from black jolts, it's, you know, that's an idealization of the real world. Uh, another thing we don't do is specify when to hedge. In the black Scholes model, you hedge continuously, which, you know, as far as the trader is concerned, that's impossible. Uh, another thing that we need to work on is providing parameters that are meaningful to traders. Uh, you want to get your parameters as close to market data as possible. And, you know, we, we don't really manage risk well either. <clears throat> and I, I like to say there are two fundamental problems in risk management. Uh, the first problem is nobody can define what risk is. Uh, the second problem is you can't hedge what you can't define. So I'm being slightly humorous here, but you know that's pretty much I think basically the, the situation. Um, you know, as for parameters for models, I worked at Bankers Trust when I was first starting out, and they used the Heston model, and you know, that has parameters that aren't really tied explicitly to market instruments. I mean, volatility kind of makes sense, but, you know, drift terms and you know, leverage terms, 
you know, asked the trader once, like what he thought of the parameters in the Heston model. And he said, well, you know, at first, you know, they didn't make much sense, but eventually I got used to them. And, you know, you could figure out parameters that would fit the market. And that's, you know, that reminds me of uh, John von Neumann's uh, saying, you don't understand math, you just get used to it. And uh, actually another example of model parameters uh, is uh, yield curves. Uh, you know, when you build a yield curve, uh, it's very common to use some kind of interpolation uh, on the curve to make it look nice and smooth. Uh, but I, that's not a good thing, I think. Uh, actually, again, at Bankers, I re remember a trader called me over. We did everything in spreadsheets there. And got into trouble with the Fed for doing that. Uh, but a, a trader called me over and he, he was showing me a yield curve that our, our models were producing. And well, it's Excel, so you can do what you want. So this trader had like zoomed in to a little portion of the curve. And he showed me some lines wiggling up and down. He's like, what's that? Well, you know, those were artifacts of the cubic, cubic interpolation we were using. And, you know, that's, that's not coming from market data. That's coming from whatever Hermit cubic tension spline du jour that we were using at the time. And, you know, again, my opinion is you should use bootstrap to build yield curves. Use piecewise flat forwards. Uh, you know, bootstrap is deterministic. Uh, you know, each instrument you add gives you a new segment of the forward curve. And if you do something dumb, like uh, add two instruments whose maturities are close to each other, then when you try and do a bootstrap, you'll see the last little segment of the curve, you know, pop way up or jump way down. Because when you're doing a bootstrap, you're only, uh, you know, you fix the first part of the curve and you're only extending it to the next uh, instrument maturity. So if that's a very short interval, you may have to move the forward for that uh, interval up or down quite a bit, you know, if there's any noise in the data. And that's a good thing because it will point out to you that you're doing something dumb. You need to make sure that you've got a good uh, spread between instrument maturity dates. Um, and it, you know, and if you want to interpolate, don't interpolate the curve. Uh, interpolate the instruments. So, so you have a seven-year and a ten-year swap, and you want an eight-year and a nine-year point. Well. I don't know, linearly interpolate our coupons between seven and 10 years to add those, you know, eight and nine year swaps. And that way, when a trader says, hey, you know, look at this curve, something is funny, you can tell the trader, oh, I linearly interpolated the eight and nine year our coupons. And that's something uh, that the trader can understand. And they can, yeah, oh, Nobody does that anymore. We don't linearly interpolate and great, you know, nobody knows everything, you don't know everything. And, you know, this is a, a mechanism for you to learn what's in a trader's mind. And then you can go back and write some code and put in whatever interpolation technique the trader prefers and then give it back to them in, in a spreadsheet if that's your tool and, you know, keep moving forward. Um, actually, another example from my banker's trust days when I was first starting out, uh, a trader came to me, uh, Billy Minton. Uh, I, don't know, I see some people on from, from banker's trust days, the olden days. Um, and, you know, banker's trust was the place to be for derivative securities back then. The home of LIBOR cubed uh, until they got into trouble. And at any rate, so Charlie said, 
you know, Keith, how would you uh, value a barrier option that knocks in the second time the barrier is hit instead of the first time the barrier is hit? And I got excited because I knew the answer. You know, I was just starting out, but, uh, you know, I didn't go to a math finance program. Um, Back then, uh, my math finance program was my dining room table, you know, after a long day getting beaten up on a trading floor, trying to understand what the heck everybody was talking about, you know, but I knew Black Scholes. Uh, I knew about barrier options. Uh, Merton figured out how to price uh, barrier options shortly after, you know, their initial paper, a uh, very clever argument uh, using the reflection uh, property of Brownian motion. And, you know, I studied Brownian motion in grad school. Uh, I completely unrelated to uh, math finance. I was, I was doing functional analysis. And, but I knew the answer. I, and I told him right away the value of a barrier option that knocks in the second time it hit exactly equal to the value of a barrier option that knocks in the first time it hits. It's, and he, you know, he kind of looked at me funny. It's like, that didn't seem right. It's gotta be worth less, you know, it has to hit twice before you. And, you know, I didn't, you know, take his cue because I was so excited I knew the answer. And I couldn't resist and I told him, matter of fact, uh, the, value, the value of the barrier option that knocks in the millionth time it hits, exactly equal to a barrier option that knocks in the first time. You see, you know, Brownian motion has this infinite variation at every local level. And the simple consequence of the law of the iterative logarithm, but there are more elementary fruit. The guy thought I was insane. And, you know, he's right. It's like, you know, can't be the right answer. I mean, mathematically, that's the right answer. It's a true mathematical statement. But, you know, Charlie didn't talk to me for months after that. And I can't blame him. It's like, it's ridiculous. It's, you can't, you know, if you can hedge continuously, that's the correct answer. But you simply can't do that. And, you know, we need to have models that allow for realistic behavior. Okay, uh, okay, all right, I guess I'm getting off on kind of a rant. So, you know, humor me for, for a minute or two. Um, and, and I promise I'll get back on track. You know, in physics, when the theory doesn't fit what you observe, you have to change the theory. It's, for some reason, mathematical finance, when the theory doesn't fit, you know, you know, whistle past the graveyard or, you know, come up with, you know, insertions like, well, you know, everybody knows that stock price jumps by, you don't know that? Like, well, that makes sense, but I'm a mathematician and I want a mathematical theory. I want to define terms, I want to specify the axioms, and I want to use mathematics to derive consequences. You know, use substitution, modus ponens. As long as I follow the mathematical rules, I'm going to end up with statements that are true. And that's the, I don't have to intimidate somebody into believing it. It's math. And you know, in physics, the, you know, one great example of of, of this is. Uh, you know, at the, the end of the 18th century, physicists thought it was just a matter of adding decimal places, you know, to the physical constants that they were measuring. But there was one nagging problem uh, they called the uh, ultraviolet catastrophe. Uh, they knew that when they heated something up, it would turn red hot and white hot. And then uh, as the temperature went up, it would emit ultraviolet radiation. And the prediction of the theory was way off. 
they were not seeing the amount of ultraviolet radiation the theory predicted. And Max Planck came along and said, hey, uh, maybe we can fix this if we assume that photons come in packages. And so he, you know, his knob was the package size and he dialed that knob and he found a, a value that fit the data uh, to the limits of, of what they could measure at the time. And this is the Planck constant. And you know, they also knew that uh, you know, electrons can't orbit the nucleus like planets orbiting the sun. Uh, to keep an electron in orbit, it would have to accelerate. And if you accelerate an electron, it gives off radiation. And they didn't see you know, atoms giving off that radiation. And so, you know, Niels Bohr came up with his toy hydrogen uh, model, assuming, you know, integral wavelengths. And, you know, they eventually fixed up their theory and came up with quantum mechanics. And, uh, you know, and that's been a brilliant success. It's, you know, when your theory doesn't work, you know, that's an indication that there's something you don't understand and it's more to learn. And, you know, mathematical finance, we're still waiting for our, you know, Werner Heisenberg or uh, uh, Ernest Schrodinger. It's uh, end of range. Uh, okay, so back to, uh, you know, an anthropologist, anthropologist point of view. Uh, like, so what are the things involved, you know, objects involved in, uh, in finance? Uh, oh, I think that's the first thing are holdings. Uh, so a holding is uh, an instrument, some amount of the instrument, and an entity. So instruments, their stocks, bonds, etc. Uh, the amounts are, you know, shares of a stock or notional in a bond. And uh, you know, the entity is just a legal entity, an individual. Uh, or a corporation, and that you know, this is you know, kind of the atomic uh, uh, matter that finance is built out of. And trading is uh, changing holdings. So at some time, uh, a buyer will exchange uh, uh, some amount of an instrument. Uh, with a seller uh, for some amount of an instrument. And the price is just the quotient of buyer amount and the seller amount. Uh, and, you know, this is asymmetrical. Uh, the buyers uh, decide what to buy and how much. And the sellers are, are passive. They uh, offer uh, a prices based on the instrument and the uh, amounts. And the buyer instrument uh, is usually the currency. So that's often left off. Holdings, trades, price. Okay, so what is price? Well, after a trade, the price is just a quotient of the amounts, but before a trade, it's something uh, more nebulous. Um, you know, if you've ever traded, you, you, you know, you know, if you're looking at your broker's trading screen and you see a price of 100 and you execute your market order, then it comes back and they say, okay, your market order cleared and the price was 101, not 100. And, you know, that's slippage. It's, you know, something can happen between the time you place your order and the time that it's executed. And so there's some uncertainty in price. You can place limit orders um, where you specify the price at which you want to get done. And you're guaranteed that if the limit order is executed, it will be executed at that price but uh, you don't know when it will get executed. This is sort of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. 
market order, you know when it will get executed. Now, you're just not sure exactly what the price will be. Uh, for a limit order, uh, you know the price, but it may take some time for it to get executed or it may never get executed. And, you know, people have looked at this and their theories that approach, you know, solving this problem, but I, I don't think it's anywhere near a complete theory. Uh, a very important thing associated with holdings that often gets short shrift in the literature is instruments have cash flows and you, you need to take those into account in your model. So stocks have dividends, bonds have coupons. Uh, futures, futures are interesting. The price of a futures is always zero. Uh, they consist only of cash flows, uh, the margin, adjustment you get every day, you know, when, when they mark the uh, future futures quote. So futures are actually all cash flow. And these, these are a little bit simpler than prices. <clears throat> Basically the, the instrument has a cash flow associated with it and you get a cash flow uh, proportional to the uh, amount that you hold. Uh, they could also depend on the uh, what what the what the cash flow is paid out in. Usually, the, the cash flows like dividends and coupons are paid in, in the currency. But they could put in other things. They could pay in other stocks or other bonds. Or you could have payment in kind, uh, potentially. And one thing to note is cash flows don't depend on the entity. It doesn't matter who's holding the instrument every holder gets the, the same cash flow. The issuer is the one that decides and this model doesn't talk about issuers. All right. Okay, so let's talk about the market model. This is what quants do. They come up with uh, a model of prices and cash flows. And you know the, your models are functions, basically random variables. And you know if you do it right, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, you know the price is obviously going to depend on the time. Uh, I and I prime are the two instruments being exchanged. Uh, e and E prime are the two entities involved. And the price is going to depend on the amount that you want. Right, so you know, positive and negative amounts. That's going to entail the bid, bid and the ask uh, price. Uh, as the amount increases, um, you know, typically the bid ask spread widens. Incorporate that, but a lot of times you'll read, you know, assume perfect liquidity, which means that price doesn't depend on amount. Uh, and then cash flows are a little bit simpler. <clears throat> and so what the model is, the model of the price is telling you is that uh, you can obtain uh, a trade at the price. Oops. So uh, the amount A that the buyer is gonna need to give to the seller is the, the amount that, the, that they're gonna exchange with the seller times the price. So I want one, one share of a stock trading at 100, I'm gonna have to pay $100. Okay. But you know, back, back to what you usually see in the, in the literature, you know, the entities and are not explicitly stated. The, um, <clears throat> usually one of the inst instruments is, is uh, currency and so that's left out. And so at the end, uh, you're basically left with a stochastic vector valued process. So X at time T is price, you know, given the state uh, of all of the instruments. So it's, you know, you get one price for each instrument. So R, R to the I is your vector. Uh, you get one entry for each, for each instrument. 
Okay, great. So we've got our market. What do you, what do we do with the market? We trade. And what, what's a trading strategy? What's a, what are trades? Right? So you pick times to trade, uh, increasing. Uh, you know, a lot of you already know the theory. So these, these are actually stopping times, they're not fixed numbers. And at each stopping time, you decide how many shares of each instrument you, you wanna, wanna transact. So that's simply a function from you know the state at time tau j, and you get a vector of how much of each instrument you you want to buy. And to, you know typically this vector is going to have many many zero components, and it might only have one non-zero component, the instrument that you're actually trading. And so you know consequences from from this are. Uh, you know, as you trade, you're going to be building up a, a position. So your position is just the sum of all the prior amounts that you, you've bought, you know, the net amount that you hold in, in each instrument. Uh, and so notice this is a strict inequality. Um, uh, and this indicates uh, the fact that uh, trades don't happen you execute your trade, but it's going to take some time before it settles and shows up uh, on the books. So that's the strict inequality. And I, I, you know, instead of gamma J, I, I call it gamma S, where S is time. And, you know, gamma S is gamma J, when S is tau J, and zero otherwise. So mathematical convenience. And two things associated with your trading strategy are the value and amounts that show up in your, your trading account. So the value is just the mark to market. Uh, you have an existing position, you unwind it at price X, how much you would get. Um, of course, the position does not include the trades that you just did. So you have to add those in too. And in reality, you cannot, you typically cannot unwind everything at the market price. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a uh, you know, reporting. And, you know, when you trade, it's, you know, they're gonna, you're gonna have a trade blotter or your, you know, broker account, and you're gonna see numbers show up in that, that account. And at any point in time, you're gonna have an existing position and you'll get all of the cash flows associated with that position. And you just bought gamma shares of X, so you gotta pay for them coming out of your account. All right, so again, take, catch, catch our breath for a second. You know, so I'm just describing reality, right? You, you, know, you pick a time to trade, you buy some stuff, gamma, those accumulate to a position. The position has a value, and trading entails, you know, amounts showing up in your in your account. You know, hopefully, this is not controversial. Okay. Okay. So now we we can uh, now that we've defined our market and trading strategy, we can define arbitrage. And so we say that arbitrage exists for a model. This is, you know, uh, you have to specify the model before you find the arbitrage. Uh, but arbitrage is if your first, the amount that you make on the first trade, A0, is strictly positive. And all of the amounts associated with the strategy are non negative uh, and until it closes out. You know, you make money up front and never lose money over the life of your trade. So, you know, clo closed out is just saying your position goes to zero. If you don't have to, if you, you, you want to do trades and not have your position go to zero, you can make money all day long, uh, just like Nick Leeson did. But um, I don't think anybody remembers who Nick Leeson was. 
And one thing to note is this definition does not depend on the measure. You know, your first trait is just a, a number. It's an amount, and it's either positive or zero or negative. And, and but you know, the ATs are actually going to be random variables, but you know, I don't really care about probabilities of anything. I just want them to be non-negative. And so this is a slightly different than the standard mathematical definition that you see of arbitrage, but you know, this is stronger and this is, you know, something that a trader would recognize. You can't tell a trader you have an arbitrage by saying, oh, you're gonna make zero dollars up front and you put it on your book, and you're gonna make some positive amount with some positive non-zero probability somewhere down the line. It's you know. Actually, even this definition is not good enough for, for a trader. It's they're going to look at the initial amount that you make and compare it to, uh, you know, how much capital they need to tie up in order to make that trade. So, you know, gamma zero, gamma zero and x zero that those are the initial position and prices, and you know, the dot product you're going to have cancellation. And so, you slap absolute values around everything before taking the dot product. That's kind of how much money is going to be involved in setting up the trade. So you want to compare the amount to, to that, your return on investment. And even that's not good enough because you want to look at gamma over the life of the trade. Okay. You know, things get hard. Okay, fundamental theorem of asset price. This is the, the juicy part. Uh, actually, I remember when Peter uh, brought me back into the academic world and I started teaching derivative securities at NYU, I, I was kind of surprised to find out there was no proof of the fundamental theorem of asset pricing uh, accessible at the, the master's level. You know, the, the math was very involved. Uh, you know, at the time, the current theory was uh, Del Bayan and Schachermeyer, who had a very sophisticated proof of the fundamental theorem, which I, I can't even state the, 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 the theorem, much less proof. Something about, you know, no free lunch with vanishing probability of normal human beings understanding what weak star algebras are. But their, their proof is 61 P. Do that if I, if I can't go through line by line. Uh, that's too hard. We need some simple. All right, so this statement of the fundamental theorem is a little easier to understand. Uh, it's all right, so uh, there's no arbitrage if there exists. Oh, I call them deflators. I have to give a name to them. They're kind of like discounts. You think of it like a discount for now. We'll give the definition later. Uh, they're actually the stochastic discount. We call them deflators, just some positive adaptive process that you know make the model prices. So you have a model XT, you deflate them, find some guy to deflate them by, and then you look at the conditional expectation at point P of a future price uh, deflated, uh, plus all of the cash flows in, in you know between you know now and the future price. Uh, also deflated, and this must hold for an art for, uh, for, for uh, a model to be arbitrage free. And uh, if, for example, if the cash flows are all zero, then this is the usual, you know, deflated prices are a model. So uh, Keith, I just want to get a comment, which is um, sure. that, like in my mind, the important thing about this result is that those Ds are, are um, positive. Um, so you wrote that, <laughs> but I just want to yes. emphasize it. Um, so the Xs here are real, but the Ds are positive. And the cash flows are real. So Xs and Cs are, are in general real, meaning they could be negative. Correct. And actually, the Ds can be bigger than one, which would or positive, but to negative interest rates. Yeah, so negative interest rates is certainly allowed here, right? Because Let's say that just means D's between zero and one in some sense, right? Yeah, that would actually be a negative realized return. 
you, yeah. you always have arbitrage with that, no matter what model you use. Yeah. So you know, I'm just saying the content, like let's say, we tr it'd be fairly easy, I would think, to say these exist if they're real valued. <laughs> okay, like, you know, um, but um, requiring them to be positive as you are it does, you know, give teeth to this result. <laughs> Is all I'm saying. All right. How are you, you going to get a cone if they're not positive? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So, and as the U goes to infinity, the time horizon, well, presumably the discounts are going to go to zero. And so this XD term is going to go to zero. And you'll get, you'll have that the price is equal to the expected value of discounted future. So this is just, you know, gram dot valuation. Old school. All right, so the first thing that we do is we're doing math now, everybody. We prove things, and so we prove a lemma. And so, okay, so this is our formula from above. X D e, e T equals conditional expectation. And uh, you know, you can prove that if you look at the, the values, the mark to market and deflate them, you get a formula that looks suspiciously like the formula right above. And the proof is high school algebra. We know what V is. M up plus delta dot D and you plug it in and you adjust terms and you end up with the right hand side. And, you know, the write up, uh, I have a link to the write up at the end where you can go through that in detail. And so you can see that prices X correspond to value V and cash flows correspond to amounts. And so the trading strategy is actually creating synthetic market instruments. These act just like market instruments, except the value is the price and the amounts are the cash flows. You know, this this is the skeleton key to derivative securities. I mean, what a derivative is. You specify amounts that you pay out in the derivative. It's a contract. We give you these amounts on these dates. You give me those amounts on those dates. That's the A's. And so, you know, the trick is to find a trading strategy that replicates those A's. Okay, and you know, anybody who's gone through the proof knows there's an easy direction in the fundamental theorem of, uh, of asset pricing. So if your amounts are always positive af after you trade, and then we use this formula, you know, value equals expected future cash flows. And then if U is big, eventually the value will be zero because the position is closed out. So the value is expected value of discounted future cash flows. All of these are amounts. All these amounts are non-negative. So this is non-negative. And again, just using the formulas, connection of value, there's no position. So delta plus gamma is just gamma dot X. And then, you know, amount is uh, delta dot gamma minus, uh, uh, sorry, delta dot cash flow minus uh, gamma dot x. Well, delta is zero because you, you don't have an existing position. So it's minus gamma dot x. So that's minus a zero. And we include the amount that you, you'll make on the first trade. It's got to be less than or equal to zero. So it can't be positive. So you can't have arbitrage. All right, hard direction. You know, many people, including myself, <laughs> have spent many, many hours of brain power trying to prove this. And, uh, you know, actually, it started with uh, Steve Ross, I think in 78 or so, who gave the first uh, grown up version of the fundamental theorem of asset pricing that worked for all instruments. Uh, it, was only, it was a one period model. And he's the guy who figured out you can use the Hahn Bonnock theorem that. Um, 
other people quickly noticed that uh, he forgot that the Han Bonnock theorem has certain assumptions before you can apply it, like interior point. And so, you know, people went to town and came up with rigorous proofs, and me too. And, I, you know, in a, all, all of the stuff I'm talking to you about is not novel. Uh, but, you know, the epiphany that I had was you don't need to prove the existence theorem. You can write down solutions, explicit solutions. I don't need to prove they exist. Here they are right in front of your nose. In order to find an arbitrage free model of prices, all you need is a vector valued martingale and a deflator, a positive adaptive. Take any vector-valued martingale, any deflator, define the deflated price to be the martingale minus the prior deflated cash flows. And you know the cash flows are not a mystery in most models. It, those are the dividends for the stock. Uh, you need to specify those, read or proportional or what have you. Uh, and once you got those in the deflator and the martingale. Okay, maybe I should divide both sides by, you know, DT, think of the price, but I, I make the claim that every model you've ever seen uh, has this form. Everything, I don't care. Stocks, bonds, commodities, beyond. This, this is why I call it the unified model. And again, you know, the um, path we can prove things. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, um... We go back to the easy direction. So the yeah, so the conclusion of the easy direction is no arbitrage. Correct. Okay. If so the deflators then, exist, there's no no arbitrage. The hard part is finding the deflators. Yeah. So let's say so the other direction to the easy direction <laughs> must be starts off by saying there's no arbitrage and then there's some conclusion. But, but you're actually not doing that. You're ending this slide with the conclusion that there's an arbitrage free model, right? Uh, correct, uh, yeah, I, you know, uh, I, well, I guess one way to think of it is, you know, our job is to build arbitrage free models. How do we do that? And what I'm saying is pick a vector valued martingale, any martingale. Pick a positive deflator, any deflator. Boom. There's your mind. Okay, but I'm just saying you're not proving the hard direction on this slide because you're you're doing something else. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm not you're doing yeah, it right. I'm not, I'm, yeah. <laughs> this other thing. Correct. Yeah, um, I'm I'm not proving it on the slide. I, you're correct. Okay. But I am pro proving deflators exist. I can't okay, well, right. Yeah. We can get into that. Or you're stating it, right? You're 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 beginning with deflators exist, and also let's let's assume the existence of martingale. Then you're concluding, you know, something's an arbitrage free model, which is fine. It's useful. I grant it's useful. I'm just saying. I think we're agreeing that it's not the opposite direction of the. Previous. Well, the the theorem says that deflators exist, and I'm basically saying that you can pick any deflator that you want and any martingale you want, and get an arbitrage free model. Yeah, so let's call this a corollary of like from the previous result, no arbitrage implies deflators exist. All right, yeah, and right. um, yeah, and now what do we have one of these deflators? Um, let's use it with a martingale to get an arbitrage free model. Yeah, okay, all right. <clears throat> okay, and it actually it turns out that the deflator doesn't come from outer space. Um, if you have uh, repos in your market that actually determines the deflator. The repo rates, uh, you know, are the, the repo rates that determine the deflator. So, so this is usually called the stochastic discount. You integrate up the repo rates and then e to the minus integral is the deflator. And okay, you caught me, I'm using continuous time you know, guilty, <laughs> uh, but you know, it, when you implement it on a computer, you're not gonna do the integral, you're gonna have a sum where DS is daily or whatever, 
you, you know, whatever data you've got for the repos that are in each particular. So, it, you know, it comes down to the martingale. And, you know, there are lots of ways to, to come up with that. All right, so we have our theory. Let's use, uh, so let's start out with uh, zero coupon bonds. So a zero coupon bond is determined by its maturity. It has exactly one cash flow, one unit at maturity. So here DU is, is not a number. It's a symbol I'm using. I don't have a ticker for a zero coupon bond, but it's a generic tick, ticker for a zero maturing at U. Okay, and then, you know, we have a theory. You know, deflated prices, the expected value of two year cash flows. There's only one at, at time U. So this is a statement. Uh, and so I'm re so in, in this equation, instead of x of t, I'm giving a name. This is now a random variable. DTU is the price at time t of the zero coupon bond. In other words, the, the price is this expected value, which you know we've all seen this before. It is, however a consequence that just drops out of the theory. You don't think after you think hard about it. Um, you know, another thing is like, what about risky bonds? No problem. So let's ha say we have a risk risky zero that gives you some recovery at default. Well, fine, it has a cash flow of one if default is after maturity. Uh, otherwise you've got recovery that occurs at default, default occurs for maturity. And you can plug it into your expected values if you're a little bit careful. Um, your sample space has to be extended to include the default time. So you need a Cartesian product with zero infinity. So you've got a default time parameter. You also have to put a filtration on that. Uh, but then, you know, computing expected values is not, not hard. It's, you know, it's a math problem, not a figure it out first principles problem anymore. What about forward rate agreements? Okay, same story. You've got two cash flows. It's, this is a symbol again, forward with day count fraction uh, delta. Uh, this is, I believe they call the effective date, and this is the termination date. And you have a you know, minus one at effective, one plus coupon times delta at termination. And, you know, kind of same story. You plug it into your equation. You get consequences. Par forward means that the price at time, par forward at S means the price at time S is zero. Zero equals S S. You expected value at time S, plug it in, da da da. da. You know, everything drops out from the deflator. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, typically uh, FRAs don't involve exchange principal amounts. Uh, they pay in arrears and there's only one cash flow, which is the difference between the coupon and the forward rate uh, at the effective date for the remaining period. Typically, you don't know that when you enter into the RA, it, it only sets when you get to the effective date. You know, you know this part coupon ahead of time. And just, you know, as an illustration of how you would use this model, I, I don't spell everything out here, but, uh, you know, what's the model in this case? Well, effective valued Martingale. And so my model, vector valued martingale is, well, I have zero coupon bonds, one for each maturity. And my model is indexed by all of these instruments. And what's the martingale? Uh, you know, if I have any, ran any random variable and I look at expected value with respect to time T, presto, I got a martingale. 
So typically models have many, many, many instruments in them. And quite often the financial literature doesn't explicitly state that. They kind of assume that there's this market uh, account that you can you know, put my park money in and take money out of, you know, as needed. And, you know, that's an implicit assumption. And I don't believe in implicit, you know, spell it all out. Putting money into the money market account, that's a transaction and you need to account for that. And so, okay, this is kind of my sloppy notation for the trading strategy, but the notion is, if I have a regular FRA and I want to create this FRA paying in, arre in arrears. Well, I can take my regular FRA and do the following trading strategy. So the first trade is at the effective date P. I'm going to go buy the zero coupon bond maturing at U. And actually, I'm going to finance that with uh, FRA. And then, so this, this one sub U is actually a big long vector indexed by U with one non zero component at U. And then at time one, which is uh, uh, termination date, I sell it back. And if you take the FRA and you throw in the trades, then cash flows for this portfolio exactly match FRA paying in arrears. And you know they, they actually, you know, these instruments have very different risk profile. Uh, if you have an FRA where you exchange notional and your counterparty goes bust, then you have to deal with uh, uh, you know, outstanding notional. Um, and actually you can, I don't know, after 2008, people started seeing funny things like uh, floating legs of swaps with different payment frequencies having different prices. And the classical theory would say, no, they have to have the same price. But actually, if you just throw in default times and recovery, you can fit the market data. It's, there are a lot of models out there that do ad hoc assumptions, but you don't need them. Just use the universal model. Okay, uh, Black Merton Schultz. How do, how do we get that? Well, we need a martingale, we need a def deflator. So, what's the martingale? Well, a constant, R, it's the bond price. And then SE to the sigma BT minus sigma squared T over two. This is a martingale. Excellent, a martingale. And my deflator, E to the minus rho T. And so prices are martingale divided by deflator. Boom, there's the black Schultz model. You want fixed dividends? Fine, throw them in. With proportional dividends, fine, throw them in. And you get, you know, the, the formula for the price. So here you go. You know, here's the formula for the price that takes into account uh, dividends. You don't need, you know, some reset guy with a bad breath telling you stocks price jump, stock prices jump by dividends. Oh, you know that? You know, it's, the only thing that jumps is this formally jumped right out of your theory with no no headaches. It's that the price for yeah. stock. With, um, with Keith, I have a question on the interpretation of this, the result you just had. Could you go back to it? The one you just had? Yeah. This one. Um, so let's say, you know, quants are aware. It's typically these two probability measures, P and Q. And um, when you write here that M is a martingale, um, um, there, there's no real world I'm thinking you, you would call it a key. There's no, okay. There, so you can say there, there, there's no, <laughs> okay. Yeah. There, there's also no deflator in my book. There, there's, <laughs> a, there's actually a, a measure. The deflator actually gives you a measure, not a function. That's another talk. Okay. Okay, uh, all right, we're, we're kind of running out of time. So I'm going to kind of jump a little bit forward here so that there's time for questions. Um, we're almost done anyway. Uh, so hedging, how do you compute a hedge? Well, I know how to compute the value of the initial hedge. I just look at the expected value of the deflated uh, amounts. And I know that this is the cost is just gamma zero dot x zero. So how do I get? M is zero, I take a derivative with respect to X zero. 
to gamma zero. And you might think, uh, my value is defined purely in terms of deflators, in my model, and amounts, which come from the contract I'm trying to price. So this, you know, it doesn't depend on x zero. Right? I can take a derivative with or it doesn't come from x zero. It's but it involves x zero. It's you know same story any at any point in the future. I, I want to take the derivative with respect to the price at time j of the value. And if you're getting nervous about taking derivatives with respect to random variables, there's no need. This have a function from one normed space to another normed space. You can take the derivative uh, using the Fourche derivative. And you know, all of this is you know, eminently computable. And so you know, the derivative actually, your, so your initial hedge is gamma, but your, in general, your hedge is gonna be a delta. The delta J plus gamma J is gonna be one, your, your next position. So the difference of your positions, that's gamma. So, you know, so delta is delta and gamma is gamma, you know, as in the, the classical delta. And this is never a perfect hedge in reality. And, you know, we need to get down to the business of, you know, swallowing that pill, accepting it and start giving you know better answers to what how to how to manage the actual risk when you're, you're trading well keith i mean if the payoff were like half mine in the instruments um why wouldn't it be a perfect hedge in that case like would so if i tried to replicate it, one it, it, no it, it, yeah okay I'm thinking, I'm, okay sure. I, I it's like i saw frederick uh Mosseller give a talk on probability and he, he tried to assign probability to English world words like often and sometimes and never and he was surprised to find that when he actually measured you know using statistics the probability people would assign to never it came up with a non-zero probability it's like and I thought about like when my wife tells me you never take out the trash okay so I'm using never in that sense Okay, sometimes you have a perfect hedge. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, okay. Uh, oh, you can, all right, you guys can read all this later. Um, and then here are the links that you can dig. dig you know, I, I hope I whetted your appetite uh, for, for this and you'll dig into things more, more, more carefully and you know, send me an email and ask me questions. So we only got two minutes of time for questions, but uh, shoot. AMA. I have a question. Go ahead and ask. So um, Peter and I had this long running debate about the value of um, you know, deflators that could be negative. Um, and I'm wondering if, if that were the case, would that invalidate these results in any way or would, the, would it change the results materially? What, what are your thoughts on that? If you have a negative deflator, you're gonna have an arbitrage independent of the model. In yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And then, like, let's say an interesting research area is, is finding it. <laughs> okay. Like, it's not actually all that easy to construct in some cases. So, um, <laughs> you know, so, you know, you're calibrating a model and, you know, let's say the, the model has a parameter that's supposed to be positive. And, you know, when you put it on data, it comes out negative. And um, then, let's say you either say, oh, I totally believe my model market prices are wrong and include arbitrage. And now I want to find that arbitrage. That's one way to go. <laughs> okay. You know, or you can include the models wrong. And I, 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 actually, yeah. you, I, you can use this theory to find the arbitrage. Um, actually, it's in the paper. Um, yeah, that's important. It, you know, it, yeah. if, you know, the Han Bonnach theorem says, if you have a convex set and a point not a, uh, in the set, then there's a hyperplane. It turns out that hyperplane tells you the arbitrage. Look at a normal vector, it's the hyperplane. That's that's the portfolio that gives you the arbitrage. Yeah, I think that's extremely important. 
um, you know, should be taught. <laughs> like, because uh, I've experienced, let's say, um, many people throwing up their hands once they sort of can't calibrate a model. And, you know, let's say one possible way to proceed is that the reason they can't calibrate is that there's, you know, the model's correct and there's arbitrage in the prices, you know. So, and, and then obviously it'd be good to know yeah. what position to take. <clears throat> so, yeah. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for 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 uh, listening. And uh, please feel free to get in touch if you you have questions or comments. Okay, we will. Um, all right. Thank you, Keith. Uh, you're right on time, and we, I'm going to um, stop the recording now, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you all next week. Okay, so bye everyone.